You know, Xenia? Okay, okay. Uh, okay, hello everybody. Happy to see you. Today is Wednesday, November 29, 2023, 16, Kislev, 5,784. This is the seventh session of eight, series number 29. We will enjoy our speaker, Rabbi Yoshua Ellis, the official rabbi of the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue. We will learn and enjoy the session. My name is Gladys Perez Moale coordinator of Women Learning Group of the Spanish and Portuguese Synagogue, Montreal. <laughs> a program created by our previous rabbi, Shahar Orestin, following our ladies bat mitzvah, celebrated on July 5, 2009. Our next Wednesday speaker, is our Reverend Cantor Daniel Ben Lolo to celebrate the final of eight sessions of series 29 that we started with the Bat Mitzvah 15 years ago. It will be musical. Please continue to join us with the same Zoom details to sing and enjoy the beautiful music. I would like to invite our friend Gigi Biton to read briefly our Rabbi Yoshua Ellis biography. Gigi Biton, Bevakasha, Bechabod. Gigi, you're uh, on. Gigi, mute. you're muted. You're muted. Okay, so thank you, Gladys. And uh, really, it's truly my great pleasure to introduce Rabbi Yehoshua Ellis, the rabbi of the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue. Rabbi Ellis was born and raised in Kansas City, which is in itself a fascinating fact because I doubt any of us hear about Jews from Kansas. I mean, it's, it sounds so foreign, even exotic in a way. Um, Rabbi Ellis earned a Bachelor's of Art in Writing and Poetics from Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado. Upon graduation from university, Rabbi Ellis worked as a Jewish environmental educator at the Teva Learning Center. Rabbi Ellis's passion for Jewish education and connection took him to Poland in 2003, where he served as a volunteer for the Jewish community of Poland, and he did so under the auspices of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. Following that year in Poland, Rabbi Ellis moved to Jerusalem to pursue smicha in order to better serve the Jews of Poland. Rabbi Ellis earned smicha as a rabbi and shochet from the Shechabar Sephardic Center in Jerusalem. He was also trained in practical rabbinics and diaspora-specific skills at the Strauss and Miel Rabbinical Emissary Institute. After finishing his training, Rabbi Ellis served in Katowice, Poland from 2010 to 2015 as the rabbi of Katowice and Silesia. Then Rabbi Ellis moved to Warsaw, where he served as the assistant rabbi to the chief rabbi of Poland and director of the Rabbinic Commission for Cemeteries in Poland. Rabbi Ellis's work in Poland has given him extensive experience in various fields, including kosher food production and supervision, Jewish education and outreach, interreligious dialogue, and extremely consequential projects that aim at settling and integrating 
Jewish Ukrainian refugees into the local Jewish communities throughout Poland. As we see, Rabbi Ellis is evidently not only well-educated, but also quite experienced in the multiple facets of keeping Jewish life alive. That's it. Welcome, Rabbi Thank Ellis. You. Thank you, Zizi. Beautiful biography. Thank you, Zizi. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, um, <laughs> so I, I have to say regarding the, the biography, I wrote it. So of course I, I wrote it to sound nice. Uh, certainly if any of it have questions, um, thank God I, I have an interesting uh, life so far. And, and thank God um, the Spanish getting having the ability and the, the 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 honor to serve at the Spanish, um, thank God, it seems such an appropriate next chapter. Um, you know, such an amazing and interesting, diverse place um to be. Mm -hmm. Um and so and it's it's a great pleasure to 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 get to speak here today, uh, as in general, but especially as the rabbi of uh, the Spanish Portuguese, such an amazing synagogue, such an amazing institution, um, and such an amazing group of people. So amongst other things, uh, I mean, I, I love being a rabbi, and and and, but I also one of my um, uh, hobbies, I guess, is uh, I'm an amateur historian. Uh, I have my favorite historians. I like to read books of history. I like to, um, and and I think it's very uh, important when we look at Jewish practice uh, and Jewish customs um, to understand how the effect, how they, how history produced them, and how they changed our history and they changed us. Um, and so with Hanukkah uh, approaching, I wanted to speak about the the secret history. I don't know if it's a secret, but the, the other histories of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is, uh, it's our, uh, arguably, it's our, our most recent holiday, right? Uh, there are people, there's a big question whether or not Yom Ha'atzma'ut is a Jewish holiday or not. <clears throat> big, lots of disagreement. I think it is. But barring Yom Ha'atzma'ut, the last holiday that we have, the most recent, is Hanukkah, um, and and this and Hanukkah um, is one of the most well, the, the history of Hanukkah is one of the most well documented histories of any holiday we have. There are contemporary Greek sources, there are contemporary Jewish sources. There's the there's the there's the Talmud Bavli, there's the Talmud Yerushalmi, there's um, there's Megillat. Um, Megillat uh, Ta'anit. There are a lot of different sources that say a lot about this holiday and a lot of different things about it. Um, and so I wanted to uh, to look at at the the uh, about the background of this holiday, the history of this holiday, even maybe a bit of how the history of how it's how it has been and how it is currently um, celebrated uh, to see what it says about the holiday and about us. Starting at this point now. Hanukkah is arguably the most widely celebrated holiday, Jewish holiday ever, right? There's almost everyone, almost every Jew lights Hanukkah candles. Um, and, and that in itself is, is, is remarkable. <clears throat> so, but let's start at the beginning. So um, the, there aren't, like I said, as I said, there, we have a number of contemporary uh, sources that talk about the history of Judea at the time. Uh, so what's the time we're talking about? We're, we're, what's the geography we're talking about? So um, the, the, um, in 586 uh, BCE, 2,500 uh, plus years ago, the, the Babylonian Empire destroyed uh, the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and led the Jews, uh, of, uh, led the Jews who were there into exile into Babylon. Uh, we, our tradition says we were there for 70 years, after which um, Cyrus the Great, uh, it, uh, who was Persian, the head of the Persian Empire, he conquered the Babylonians, and he, led the, he allowed the Jews to, to return to Israel and to rebuild Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple. Um, and so we, were, we, were, we went back and we started slowly <clears throat> to reestablish ourselves and our ancestral homeland. Sounds familiar. Um, and... Uh, and uh, geopolitics had a big effect. The the Assyri the um, the Persian Empire fell to the Greek Empire, uh, fell to uh, Alexander of Macedonia, 
uh, Alexander uh, about the year about 330. Uh, there's a, an Alexander of Macedonia, Alexander the Great. Uh, he brought with him uh, something completely new, um, which was Hellenism. Uh, Alexander's, uh, Alexander the Great, his design for <clears throat> how to deal with, with, um, with conquered territories was unique. Um, and what he established was that um, uh, they established major cities uh, in, in all of the different areas he conquered. Um, and he, there he made the administrative language Greek so that uh, throughout the Greek empire, a Greek speaker could, could operate in any of the, any of the places. Um, and amongst other things, um, he he wasn't interested in disrupting local life. Rather, um, he wanted to to fit his system of administration uh, on top of it, and to insert in a few places. And one of them is there are many cities that he had named after him, uh, but also he had um, a tradition talks about the fact that he um, he insisted that he be made one, part of the local pantheon. Right. the the area he conquered were all um were all paganistic areas except for Israel uh, and they had uh, the the locals had a handful of gods to choose from and so he said you know what I'm not getting rid of them but add me to them right that way I can I'll, I'll, that way I'll have guaranteed fealty so there's a it's it's written in the Gemara about the, the high priest uh, Shimon Shimon Sadik that when he when when uh, when Alexander's armies were approaching. He uh, Shimon Sadik left the the Beit Hamikdash. He went out in the the clothes of the high priest, the the crown and the the, uh, the special outfit, the the Hoshen Mishpat, the the breastplate with jewels, and he went and he approached uh, the horse of um, of Alexander the Great. And Alexander uh, he he got off his horse and bowed down to Shimon Sadik. And, and the 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 story is written in the Talmud says that he he reported that every time. But when he, before he went to battle, he would every battle that he won, he saw a vision of this man. So thank God, our, from the beginning, the relations were good. The uh, it was explained to Alexander that we can't um, we can't add him to our pantheon because we don't have a pantheon. We have just one God, and we can't add or subtract. So instead, uh, the but in, instead, what was proposed is that that all the Jewish boys born that year would be named Alexander. As a, in order to make it to shore fealty and to make us to make us loyal to Alexander the Great, and to this day, Alexander remain uh, remains a very popular Jewish name in Hebrew today. The Alexander, the the shortened version is Arik. Uh, I have a number of friends who are, who are Arik um, to the, to this day in Israel. So, um, Israel about the year three thirty, Israel became integrated into uh, the Greek Empire, and um, and Greek culture came to Israel, came to the Jews. Greek uh, and classic Greek culture, very different than classic Jewish culture um, in many ways. The, um, the, um, and for the first time ever, um, Jews had contact with a culture that was as attractive, if not more attractive than ours. Yeah, up until now, um, all the different, the Babylonian, the Persian, all these different cultures, I mean, we might have we might have joined them here and there in order to get ahead in society, but the cultures themselves weren't that attractive. They weren't that advanced. With Hellenism, things were different. The they brought with them Greek philosophy, um, the Greek arts, which are at, at this point very refined, uh, and of course uh, Greek games uh, and the uh, the gymnasium. So there were um, th there were points of friction. Um, whenever there's a new culture, there always is, and there are parts of Jewish culture that are very much at odds with Greek culture. The worship of the body by the Greeks is very much at odds, uh, and this created a, a, a point of friction, especially regarding circumcision, which we see to this day in Europe. It's the same idea. Um, the the basically the idea that the Greek idea that the body is perfect. And therefore, circumcision is a crime against perfection and a crime, therefore, even against the gods. This is very much alive today in Europe. Um, and and the, also the Greek, uh, the Greek universalism worked to a degree um, with with our tradition. Judaism is a is a universalistic tradition, but we're still a particularistic people. 
Uh, and this particularism uh, slowly gave rise to greater and greater conflicts between the Greeks and, and the Jews. Um, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem became a polis, became a Greek city. Um, and, and things progressed. When, uh, on the, um, when you talk about the geopolitical front, Alexander died without any children. So his empire was divided uh, between four of his generals. Um, and <clears throat> the area where Israel is uh, fell under the, the reign of the Seleucids. Um, and their, uh, their, ancestor, their king was Antiochus, a name we know well. Um, for, for initially, like I said, things went well. Um, the, the Jewish elite worked well with the Greek elite. Um, and the the Jewish people themselves, the the the, the commoners, they they were they lived far from and and from the cities, and probably didn't even really know what was happening in the cities. Um, the the you know in in the in the towns and villages, uh, you had the good old fashioned religion, old fashioned Judaism, and the people would come two or three times a year, maybe at most, to to Jerusalem. Uh, and there, a lot of the institutions, the Greek institutions, they might not even see because why would they go into those places? They just they just went to the temple. <clears throat> so um, this um, the conflict started occurring under uh, an, uh, Antiochus IV, who called himself Epiphanes. Uh, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes um, sought to make himself um, sought to add himself as a god to Jew to to Jewish practice, the practice at the time. And he sought to transform the temple to a, a place of worship of uh, of Greek worship. Additionally, um, he he uh, created a number of anti-Jewish laws, um, and these were issues were particular uh, uh, against the particularism of, of Jewishness. Um, you, the Jews had to work on Shabbat. The Jews were forbidden from keeping kosher, uh, and of course, as I mentioned, circumcision. Another um, another thing he did, which uh, you see isn't mentioned in many sources, but we see from the, the Talmud Rushalmi, is, is he created the institution of, uh, in America, and here in English we refer to it as First Night. First Night is the institution by which the night of a marriage, when, when, a, when a, a couple's married, a Jewish couple were married, the first night of the marriage, the wife would not spend that night with her husband, rather she'd spend it with the local Greek administrator. Um, uh, this is we, it was pra it's been practiced throughout the world, and and, I, uh, uh, and so this certainly created a, a very big source of conflict. So this was we're talking now about the year one sixty nine uh, BCE, one hundred sixty nine one hundred sixty nine years before our common era. So I'll, I'll pause right now. If there are any questions or any any comments? No. Okay, well, everything's clear. It's the first time I hear that about the imposition to uh, have the bride spend the first night with the local administrator. Wow. And if you see it, and, and a lot of the sources, they, they talk about, so if you look at the halakha, it says that women, we'll talk about this, but women have a special, um, are specially connected to Hanukkah because they were part of the miracle. So what does that mean? And there, there are a few different answers, but one of them, but also part of it is that they were particularly targeted. And in general, just like today, the enemies of Israel usually in particular target Jewish women. Right? We see it in this week's Parsha with the, the rape of Dina. We saw it uh, on October 7th with the, 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 um, with the you know, with all of the, 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 the huge outpouring of violence specifically aimed at Jewish women. Um, and uh, we see it, it was there as well. Um, the, the main source I know for this is the Talmud Dushalmi. Um, when it comes to the origin of the Jewish revolt, there are two different origin stories. There's one from the Talmud Babli and one from the Talmud Dushalmi. So very briefly, we have we have two Talmuds. Uh, there, there were the, the Mishnah, uh, which is the first time, uh, which is the first time that the oral law was written down. That was redacted in Israel in the in Sephoris in uh, the, or in the Tiberias area or in the Galil the Galilee uh, about the year one seventy five uh, CE. So uh, and that was redacted by Yehuda Hanasi um, and his his court. Um, and then there were um, there were 
two major areas where commentaries and uh, on that were were composed and 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 also and recorded. One being in um, in Babylon, and and this gave birth to the Babylonian Talmud, uh, which uh, was redacted about the year three seventy five four hundred CE. But the other is the they call it the, the the was in the area where the uh, of of the Ga Galilee where there's still Jewish communities still existed, um, and um, that's this is called it's referred to as the Palestinian Talmud or the Talmud Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud. We call it the Jerusalem Talmud out of respect and love for Yerushalayim, even though at the time no Jews lived in Yerushalayim. So the in general. Mo, the most studied of the two Talmuds is the Babylonian Talmud. It's much, it's much bigger. The language is we're more used to it. it it's, um, it's more discussion oriented. Um, and, and so a lot of our sources, and it's also because we studied it more, um, we, we know it better, and it's a source of more of, of our traditions. Um, so the the origin of the revolt, according to the the Babylonian Talmud is that um, there was in this town of Modi'in, which is, thank God, a city today. I think it's the third or fourth largest city in Israel. Um, and the, but by the time it was a, it was a town, uh, there lived a family of, um, of Kohanim, of, of priests, um, by the, they were the, the Hashemon, they were from the, the family, we call them the, Mac, the Maccabees or the Hasmonians, Hashemonaim, Mac, or Maccabaim. Uh, Maccabi is from, is, is a term that was given to one of the, the sons. So there's this family, the, the Hasmonean Hashmonaim, uh, and they were there. Um, and the Greeks sent they, the Greeks set up a, a altar for Greek religious worship in Hashmonaim, and they uh, and they, they they brought all the locals to watch a, a Jew offer a sacrifice there. Um, so according to the Yushalmi, um, when when this Jew tried to do it, um, the 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 father. Um, uh, of the Maccabees, uh, Matityahu, uh, no, no, um, not Matityahu, he was the son. Um, I'm sorry, I always forget my, I, I, I get my, my the, the names of my Hashemoni mixed up. Uh, but the the father rose up, and he killed the killed the Jew, and he killed the Greek uh, uh, military officer, and he said, "Whoever's with God, you know, follow me." And this is the beginning of of the of the Hasmonean revolt, Hashemonian re revolt, which uh, which initially was a it, which started as a guerrilla war uh, and eventually liberated Jerusalem in the year 165. 165. Let me check. Yeah, 165 BCE. So that's the so the the regarding the liberation, uh, all of the everyone agrees. The the Yushalmi and the, the Babli both agree on most of those details. But there's a disagreement. the 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 story of the beginning of the uprising is the, the one I told you is from the from the Babli, and that's the classic one we usually hear. And Yushalmi it's a bit different. It talks there about a wedding banquet that um, that the, the Hashmonaim were marrying off one of their daughters. Uh, and so they had a big wedding banquet uh, and everyone was happy and everyone was singing and drinking and all that, all the things you do at a wedding banquet. And in the and of course, at the head table, you have the, the bride and the groom. And in the middle of everything, the bride starts taking all of her clothes off. And this is, I mean, imagine, imagine a Hasidic wedding, right? The, uh, the bride starts, you know, everyone's up in arms and, and, and the father, her father and her brothers, they, they how can she do this? Not she, like, right. This is so impure. Let's we, this kind of thing, we, we should kill her. And she said, me, you want to kill me? How can you have a party when you all, everyone here knows that tonight I'm not sleeping with my husband. And they said, she's right. And this was the source of their uh, of the revolt. This is the beginning of the revolt. Um, the the um, so the, the revolt started, and like I said, it was initially a, um, a guerrilla war fair, um, and uh, and it's and it was in many ways. There are many ways to look at this revolt. One is a revolt of the towns and villages against the city. Uh, another is a revolt of Jewish culture against Greek culture. Um, there were uh, this revolt in the it, it started the, the revolt started one sixty nine and one sixty five. So we're going backwards, right? This is BCE. So one sixty nine is so four years later in one sixty five, the um, the Hashmonaim they succeeded in liberating Jerusalem, Jerusalem, 
and, and purifying the temple uh, and rededicating it. That uh, this is where the mirror, this is where the holiday of Hanukkah comes from. But that was not the end of the revolt. The revolt went on for a long time, uh, and there were many reverses. The Yushalayim at one point is lost and reconquered. The, eventually, the um, Ju, uh, the um, the kingdom become the, the kingdom of Yehuda becomes uh, greater and greater in size, uh, partially due to the military exploits of the Hasm of the Hashmonaim, partially in, uh, because of geopolitical realities at the time. An alliance is made between different between the Greeks and the Romans, uh, and 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 the Jews as well. Um, Hanukkah, the, the miracle, the, the, the 25th of Kislev, 165, the, the rededication of the temple, doesn't represent the end or the beginning of this revolt. It's a midpoint. And this is, I think, one thing very important for us to understand uh, for about um, from a perspective of, of faith uh, and, and what we do and what we don't celebrate is um, we almost almost no victories are complete, and 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 whether something is a defeat or a victory depends often about whether or not we keep going. On Hanukkah, the the rededication of the Beit Hamikdash, it's a huge miracle, a great thing, and, and the the miracle of the oil also huge miracles, and they changed Jewish history completely. It's pretty clear we wouldn't be here today had the had the Beit Hamikdash Temple not been rededicated. Then, that being said, it gave birth to myriad difficulties and complications. Um, the um, so one important point about Hanukkah is the um, that women were very much at at the heart of the persecutions and at the heart of the revolt. There's also the story of Yudit and Holifernes. Um, I'm not sure if people know that or not. I'm happy to tell it, but I don't need to if people know it. People, is, is, this is a, it's a well-known story. Gladys, you know the story of Yudit and Holifernes? The story of what? Yudit and Holifernes, Judith, in Holy Fernies. there's a mm -hmm. lot of uh, the, the the there was a lot of art done about it, especially the the uh, what the, the old masters they love this. You see an uh, image of so Judith and Holy Fernies, It comes from the story of the book of Judith, uh, Judith. It, it, the, so so I should, sorry. I'll, I'll add there are two major books in the that are that are associated with the Bible, but not part of our canon that talk. Uh, that are are placed in this area historically. The first is Maccabees. Maccabees one and two. Maccabees one and two is uh, is a pretty clear um, recording of the events that happened uh, as part of the revolt. Um, and there's also the book uh, of Judith. Judith. So um, the book of in the book of Judith it describes uh, about there was a and it, it's. The our tradition places it at this time, but the book itself doesn't indicate that. Now, according to the book of, of Yudit itself, it's not clear historically when it happened. Uh, but the the story is that there was a Greek uh, that there, there was the, the, according to the book it doesn't say Greek. There was a there was um, there's a military force that was in, besieging Jerusalem, and the leader was the general Holyphernes. And Holyfernes uh, demanded of the local Jewish population someone to keep his bed warm. Uh, and of course, no Jewish woman wanted anything to do with this until finally Yudit volunteered and because she, she had a plan. Uh, so what did she do? She, she went into the, the tent of, of the general Holyfernes and, and she said, wait, 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 let's not, let before we get to the second part of the night, let's 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 have dinner. Come on, he, like be you know, be a nice guy. You know, the, the, at least there's no movie. At least dinner. And so she uh, she made him a very very salty cheese dish. 
uh, and 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 so salty that he had to drink and more and more and more wine. Uh, and so he drank so much wine that he passed out in his drunkenness. She then cut his head off and put it in the middle of the camp. When the soldiers saw the head of the general, they all abandoned. So this story is associated with Hanukkah by our tradition, but it's not clear from the from the book itself when it happened. Um, again, the same themes of violence uh, of of persecution persecution against Jews, specifically targeting women, and them and a woman a Jewish woman taking action in order to uh, to change things. Um, so the I won't. This is the point where I think I'll, I'll stop talking about the history of the revolt. The revolt in, in one sixty five. Thank God it was successful. Uh, we drove, uh, we we drove the the Greeks from uh, our, from Yerushalayim from our temple. We uh, and it, it had been a site of uh, of pagan worship, including uh, pigs. Uh, so why are so why are um, there are many there are many different animals that are unkosher. Right, shrimps on kosher, donkeys not kosher. Um, you, you know, there's a whole whole long list of animals that are on kosher. Why are pigs so bad? Right, everyone knows. I, I almost every you know, so many Jews I know, they tell me, you know, I I'm not so careful about kashrut, but I'll never eat, I'll never eat pork. I'll never eat pork. Right, but there there are other things that are. If you look in the Torah, if you eat a, if you eat uh, if you eat cow meat with blood in it, it's just as bad as eating pork. So why? Why are pigs so 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 um, so disgusting to us? This, it's brought in the Gemara that there was a time, and this is this is actually the, during the Hasmonean era. There was a there, af, after the reconquest of Jerusalem. There are many times one of the problems of the 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 um, Hasmonean um, the um, the um, the, um, the kingdom or the king the um, not the legacy. Uh, the dynasty that was set up was they didn't really have a clear order uh, or rules for secession. And then it's nice, it's, it's a bit more democratic. On the other hand, it, it created a lot of problems. Uh, and, it, and it created more than once. The, uh, we had um, civil wars between Jews about who would, would rule Jerusalem, which Jewish group, which Jewish party of the same family. So... Um, at, during one of these civil wars, you had uh, uh, Jerusalem, the city of, of Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, was besieged. You had, you had, on the inside, you had Jews. On the outside, surrounding it, you had Jews. And, and they were fighting this war, but everyone agreed that the temple service had to continue. So every day, the, the Jews who were in the Temple Mount, and on top, they would lower down a basket with two coins, and then they'd raise a basket and there'd be two sheep there, which is for the daily sacrifice. It was necessary every day. The, 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 the korban tamid, the daily sacrifice that was supposed to be brought every day. So in the Talmud, it's related that one of that uh, one of the men in the army below who studied Greek wisdom, he said, you know, as long as we keep giving them the sheep for the sacrifice, we're never going to succeed. They're always going to have God on their side. And they said, okay, that makes sense. So what should we do? So the next day, the, 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 the Jews on top lowered down the, the basket with the two coins. Uh, and when they raised it up, there were two pigs there. Uh, and so it says in the Gemara that after, when they did this, the whole earth shook. It was something, so, it was such, such a disgusting violation of, first and foremost, of, of this common ground between these two parties. This understanding that regardless of our of our feud, we still have this common denominator. Our, our love and awe and respect of God and, and our desire to worship him. Um, and so from this point on, uh, pigs have been associated with with Greek wisdom, which later be, which is then associated with the West and uh, the wickedness of the West. Um, and and became something um abominable and, and to to Jews um the so 
like I said, we have many sources that talk about uh, the military victory. Um, and and the historic uh, the history around and that that gave birth to the miracle of Hanukkah. The um, interestingly, one of the main places we're lacking any information about Hanukkah is in the oral law. So I mentioned previously uh, the Mishnah. The Mishnah is the first. Uh, so the, the, a brief note: oral law and written law. The, the Jews, uh, this it's a classic joke, I'm sure everyone knows it, but I'll tell it anyway. So when, when God wanted, to, before God gave the, the Torah to the Jews on Sinai, uh, our tradition it says in the Torah, and we interpret it, that he offered it to other nations first to see if they wanted it. Ultimately, so that when, when all the other nations complained, you know, how come the Jews are the chosen people and not us? God could say, look, I gave you, I offered it to you, you said no. So so the joke goes that he offered, the, God brought the Torah and he offered it uh, first he offered it to the, the Germans. And they say, well, what does it say? And he says, he, God says, it says no murder. And so the Germans said, no, thank you. Uh, and then he offered it to the French. And they said, well, what does it say? And God said, uh, it says uh, that you can only be with your wife. You know, no, no, no adultery. And they said, no, thank you. Uh, and he offered it to, to the Arabs. And they said, well, what does it say? And he says, it says no, no thievery. And they said, no, thank you. So he offered to the Jews, and we asked, how much does it cost? And God says, it's free. So we said, well, give us two then. Uh, so this is the, 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 so we have two Torahs. We have the, the written Torah and the oral Torah. Um, and, and we, in, in fact, the, the written Torah was given to us. And the transmission started on Sinai when when on uh, when when all of Am Yisrael was at Sinai, the whole nation was at Sinai, and we met God there, and He gave us the Torah, and it and and it was completed the, uh, uh, right before the death of Moshe Rabbeinu in the on the on the plains of Moab, just across the River Jordan from the land of Israel. There, Moshe Moshe Rabbeinu he finishes writing the Torah down, and, and he completes it, and he gives it to all of the nation of Israel. Before we ever received the written Torah, we already had the oral Torah. So first, the word Torah, the word Torah means um, education. Similar to the word mor Mora is a teacher. So if mor Mora, the mim at the beginning is, is an active version of, of Torah, Torah is education, what's taught. So before we ever had a written version, we had an oral version. Uh, ostensibly, the oral Torah started with Adam Harishon, the first person ever, uh, because he met God, uh, and he and God told him what to do, and he didn't do it, and so he had, he, had, he he both had he had a relationship with God, and he also received a commandment, and and he failed to do it, and then he had to, so he was able to pass this knowledge on to his children. I imagine he did because it was probably the most valuable information knowledge he had ever. How, what what it's like to talk to God, who God is, what God wants from us, how we how we know the will of God, how we fulfill it, and what we do when we don't fulfill it. And in a nutshell, that's all of the Torah, all of the oral Torah. How to how to be in contact with God, how to serve God, how to how to fulfill His will, uh, who He is, and how we interact with Him. So it says in the Gemara in the Babylonian Talmud that God only gave us the written Torah on Sinai because we already had the oral Torah. Um, and the, we see the progression throughout the Torah. We see this progression. And, and understanding the, the oral Torah is many things, um, but uh, it's there's no single... We have In the written Torah, there's 613 commandments, 613 mitzvot. Not a single one of them is... is clearly delineated in all of its details in the written Torah. For that, you need the oral Torah. And ultimately, the oral Torah is something that's never finished being created. It's the oral Torah, the, the, the many, so it's been written, it's been recorded at different points in history. The first recording of it was the Mishnah, which is associated and in, in, comes at a time right just at the end of the Hasmonean era. Um, the 
So the the when the idea was this is a year about I said as before it was written it was redacted about one seventy five it existed the, these this the wisdom and the statements of the Mishnah existed for hundreds of years already but they'd never been written down every rabbi memorized them in the, and taught them in the own his his own way and he had the authority to do so by the year one seventy five by or about one fifty C E it was already clear that the Jews are spreading throughout the world. And that if we don't write down the core of the written of the oral Torah, God forbid it could disappear. Until then, it had been prohibited to write it down, because uh, as it says in the Tao Te Ching, that you know it says the Tao that is that is spoken is not the true Tao. As soon as you write down the oral Torah, you lose a lot of what it actually is. And so much of what it is 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 in the transmission from one person to another. That being said, it was time already to write it. It was, it was, was there's too much danger that we'd lose it. So there were six different parts, six different major sections of the Mishnah. We call it the Shishe Sidre Mishnah. The first one deals with agricultural laws. The second one deals with Shabbat and holidays. So Shabbat and holidays, it's we have a, it have a different tractate, a different book uh, in this section. For each of the major holidays and Shabbat, we have one for Shabbat, one for Eruv, uh, one for then we have Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, um, Pesach, Sukkot, and uh, minor holidays. We have Purim. The one we don't have anything about is Hanukkah. It's left out completely. Um. So, um, and. The question is why. Um, so there are a few different understandings of, of, of why, and this is this is uh, I'll talk about this a bit, and then there will be all open for further questions. Um, why why is Hanukkah left so much left out of the oral Torah? Um, so the the Hashmonaim, the dynasty, which was a dynasty that came out of this revolt. They were a dynasty of priests. Um, and it's clear from the Torah that the only dynasty that's ever permitted uh, to lead the nation of Israel is the Davidic dynasty. So the, with, the, that, the, with the priests coming and taking over, that's certainly sanctioned by Jewish law. But when they passed, when they when they took control and made their dynasty a hereditary dynasty that should pass from one priest to the next, this was in complete contravention of Jewish law and tradition. Uh, the redactor of the Mishnah, Rabbi, Rabbi Hura Nasi, he was a direct descendant of King David. He was part of the Davidic dynasty. So there's, there are some opinions that say that he specifically left, left Hanukkah out of the Mishnah because, you know, it was a big slight against his family. Um, to, to take it a step further, um, it's um, it might have been too difficult theologically for him to approach. How can we have a holiday? On the one hand, we're celebrating the liberation of Israel, but but it's it didn't create the government it was supposed to create. It, it created neither the government nor society nor state that we had envisioned all along. Sure, it was an independent Jewish state, but it's not the one. Is this the one we prayed for? And this is this question to this is a very relevant question to this day. When it comes to the debates about uh, about the the current state of Israel, um, uh, another reason why it might not be mentioned in these earlier Jewish sources is that it takes time for holidays to be adapted and to be accepted by the whole community. The uh, What's written in the Gemara, uh, so there's nothing written in the Mishnah. There are a few pages in the Gemara, in the Babylonian Talmud, and a few in the Rishami written about Hanukkah. And they talk about that after, that after Israel, the, the, after um, the nation, after, sorry, Jerusalem was liberated and the temple was cleansed and rededicated, and the miracle of the uh, the miracle of one cruise of oil, the, the first miracle of finding one pure cruise of oil to light the Hanukkah, and then the miracle of it lasting eight days. 
uh, that after that, that it was initiated by the priest that every day that there should be lighting of Hanukkah candles every uh, every year at that time. How how much time did it take for that to spread from the temple courtyard to to the city of Jerusalem, to the towns and villages surrounding, and then all the way to Babylon, which is ultimately where most of the Jews were living at the time. Right? How much the the it, one thing we know about the Jews is that we adapt slowly, especially when it comes to religious practice. And so how much time, it could be that by the time of the writing of the Mishnah, it wasn't widely practiced yet. Um, the Hanukkah, uh, without, um, Hanukkah is, is, the last holiday we have. It's, it's the most recent in a hol hol a holiday that's been created as part of us. Um, it's um, it's clear that it, it's an essential holiday. We would not exist as Jews today had we not risen up then. Had we had we had we had we continued to keep Judaism in secret and in silence, we would be a spent force. And we would have been, we would have disappeared just like so many other religions and cultures that existed throughout history, especially the, at that time and that place. Um, we're not just a religion. We're not just a wisdom. We are a nation. And our strength is in our being a nation. And Hanukkah returns that to us. Our pride, our power, um, and our our self our self control and our self rule. With that came innumerable difficulties. Innumerable difficulties, including uh, a huge disagreement about who who who's really Jewish, who's the true Jew. And these are questions and battles that raged throughout the Second Temple period and afterwards as well. So very similar to our time today. One of the clear messages of Hanukkah is that redemption is not usually what we think it's going to be. And just because it's not what I wanted, not what I expected, not what I thought it would be, it doesn't mean it's not redemption. It doesn't mean it's not holy. So I'll add one postscript, which is that Hanukkah today is arguably the most widely celebrated Jewish holiday ever, right? The, I don't. There, there are a lot of Jews. Who, everyone talks about you know every Jew goes to to halt to, to shul once a year on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It's not true. It's not true. Uh, you know, and, and, if, and if if people do, when their kids don't, you know, and and uh, who said there? Okay, a lot of Jews do seder, but it's not. Almost everyone lights a Hanukkah. Certainly, the majority of Jews. It's it's easy. It's not hard, right? And it's, it's the, every part of it's so easy to do. So this is is thanks. My understanding historically is thanks very much to the reform movement. The early, the classic reform, the early reform movement, uh, had a really big problem in that it was it was really boring and unattractive, especially for children. Uh, you know, instead of the 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 liturgy, they they. They cleansed the liturgy, wasn't so interesting, wasn't so musical. And all of the uh, the rabbi's sermons were all about this kind of, um, this universalistic um, um, morals and codes. And for kids, there's really nothing there. So what did they do? They, they, they used Hanukkah as a way to get kids involved. And the the widespread celebration of Hanukkah today, from my my understanding, is thanks very much to Reform Judaism. Yeah, I, 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 I'm an Orthodox rabbi. I'm not supposed to say good things about Reform. I know, uh, but um, the we never know what the source of light will be. And we have to be able to, we have to be willing, you know, when we find it, 
to 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 to, to light to 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 take from that light and to spread that as well. So that's the that's the end of my prepared uh, my prepared material. If you have any questions or comments. I just want to clarify, did you say we never know what the source of light will be? Or you said something so, else? That's no, light, said. very much on the theme of Hanukkah. And, and light, the you know, the light of Hanukkah represents many things. Uh, there's the the especially the, the fact, you know, it's interesting that the light of the menorah was is pure olive oil. Because the Greeks have a the Greeks have a very strong tradition about olive oil as well, right? According to the Greeks, the olive was invented by Athena, the goddess of wisdom. When there was a, they were dedicating. Uh, there was a, there's an argument the city of Athens about who who would they would name it after, whether it'd be named after Poseidon or Athena. So they 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 told each god give us a gift. So uh, Poseidon he created a um a um a spring, and and but it was salty water, so. Eh. So what did Athena do? Athena created the olive, and she said, "Look, the olive in the, the the you have the oil. The you can make oil. You can eat it. You can burn the the pit. You can burn the wood. You can use it for art. Every part of it's usable. Every part of it has function. Um, olive oil for us, in fact, it doesn't is also very is, is associated. It's the when you talk about the light of the menorah, which is supposed to light light the wisdom of Jewish tradition, it has to be olive oil. Further." It says in the Gemara that uh, that eating that eating olive oil will makes you wise. Makes you what? Wise. Um, wise. Makes... Wise. Yeah. Wise. Okay. I want you to know um, if you would uh, elaborate on the concept of redemption. You said you you um, connected it to Hanukkah. And you said it's not necessarily what you th a person would think it would be. So, are you saying it could be, um, it could be, sur well, I don't know, a survival as a, as a Jewish people. It could be uh, that we have our own land. Just a second, where are we? Uh, so that's well, what I'm asking you. So the um, it's. It's clear that we're waiting for the Mashiach, right? So, who will the Mashiach be? What will he do? There's a lot written about it, and a lot of it's very contradictory. The Rambam, uh, he, he makes the he makes it very non-magical. The Rambam says that the Mashiach will be a king of Israel, who is as wise as as Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon. Who has prophesied nearly on the level with Moshe Rabbeinu that the whole world will recognize his wisdom and his leadership, and the whole world will willingly submit to his leadership. That he will uh, bring back the the scattered children of Israel back to Israel. That he will fight a war against the Malik, against our our eternal enemies, the people, anyone who's sworn to to destroy us, and that he will rebuild the Beit Hamikdash. So, so this is this is Mashiach bin uh, bin David. To complicate things, there's also Mashiach bin Yosef. The Gemara talks about the Mashiach bin Yosef. There are two. Mashiach bin David. What? There are there two. Are two. Two Mashiach. And the idea, yeah, and the idea generally understood is 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 we're talking about two different eras or two different processes. Because we have, when we have, <clears throat> we have two examples of of kings. Uh, we have the the D David and the Davidic dynasty, but before that, long before that, we already had Yosef, who was a king in in Egypt. So Yosef, uh, his role was not a spiritual one per se; it was more of a physical role. Why was he king? Because he kept Egypt alive. And this is an essential part of any king. You know, first and foremost, the the rule the the role of a government is to keep is to keep their their citizens or their, their alive, safe and 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 fed. 
um, one of the reasons why people are so upset with the, the failures of the government now in Israel, because of the safety part. So, but his understanding is that the, in the, the um, is that the, um, that Mashiach bin Yosef will precede Mashiach bin David. Um, and that they're two, speak about two different processes. If you look in the if you look at the Gemara and other uh, more mystical sources, they talk about all the all the great miracles that will be for, performed by the Mashiach, how he'll be able to smell lies, how so there exactly what redemption will look like, it's not so clear. Um the we we live in a time where um the land of Israel is under Jewish sovereignty, where in Israel there's enough to eat, uh, and we have the tools necessary to keep Jews safe. When near where every Jew, depending on how you define a Jew, is able to move to and live in Israel. Um so does this count as redemption? Um if so, I think the the story of Hanukkah can help us to see. Yeah, certainly it does. I think that's what it, you just said. The last it certainly time. it does. If I look, if you look at if you look at the situation we have now through the lens of Hanukkah, well, Hanukkah wasn't even. They didn't even. They had only control. The the dedication was only. They all they had control of was was Jerusalem. And and they had to fight many wars still after that to keep it going. And we celebrate that as, as a redemption. We celebrate that as a reestablishment of Jewish sovereignty and and of the and of uh, of a Jewish dynasty. You know, to this day, every Jew, the whether it's the Hasidim or whether it's Reform or anyone else, they all recognize this as a, as an event of major religious and historical import. Something that at the time, even after Hanukkah. The majority of the Jews remained in Babylon. Today, thank God, the biggest Jewish community in the world is in Israel. Um, it's not what anyone expected. It's not, and we all, and, and it's, it doesn't look anything like if you read all the any of the anything for the last two thousand years written about what the world will look like. We know in the times of the Messiah, even if you read the early Zionist literature, this is not the world they envisioned. It's not the state they envisioned, but it's ours, um, and it's it, it, we. It's put us in a. It, 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 it's um. It's an amazing. It's an amazing place. Um, it, it's Jewish sovereignty. It's Jewish control. It's Jewish protection. Um, it's it's Jews in control of Jewish destiny. Clearly, certainly, this seems like redemption to me. Thank you. I I have a question. Um, I'm sorry, I can't get the video today. I can only get the audio. Um, Rabbi, could I ask you how long did the Hashmanian dynasty last? So it says in the Gemara that if anyone tells you that they're, they're from the Hashmonian dynasty, don't believe them. Hashmonian dynasty, um, it the last most likely it ended most likely with um, uh, it ended with Herod, right? Herod people call him Herod the Great, but there's no source for that. The Great part, uh, Herod the the Hashmonians they they took over. Um, uh, the, starting in 165 BCE, um, and they and they start they fought wars of conquest of, and expanded the territory of Israel greatly. Um, and in doing so, they took over a group called the Edomian, yeah. Edominians, um, who lived uh, in what's now Jordan. Um, and they forcibly converted them. Um, and they, and in the end, they integrated some of the uh, of the Edominians into the elite of Israel. Uh, and from that, you had uh, Herod, who married the last 
uh, of the Hashmonian uh, princesses and became king. He took throne. I want to. He took control. I want to say in the early. In in the. Now my numbers are fuzzy here. I I can see my text. I don't think I have anything in my text about it. It's uh, okay. It's, uh, it must have lasted uh, like close to hundred years or so, right? Eh? Because so the, the Rambam, the Rambam writes, the, so the, there's there's Jewish sovereignty in Israel, and there's a Hasmonean dynasty, which are not the same. I see. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the Edominians, I took, I believe Herod was around the year zero. He, he took over, and then he built, he's the one who's responsible for beautiful, uh, for all these, for many of the beautiful buildings we have it had in Israel. He he rebuilt the, the Beit HaMikdash and made it something of great beauty. If you ever go to Masada, he built that. Yes. Um, it, and this is all, uh, you know, so, and he died, I want to say he died about 35 CE, but my my numbers aren't so clear there. The in the Rambam talks about Jewish sovereignty referring for more than 200 years. Um, you know, certainly you can say, you can talk about the area of Jewish sovereignty in Israel lasting from 165 or 165 BCE to 68, which is the year that Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. Uh, well, CE. 120 years. This, uh, uh, six, no, the, the, because it's, yeah, it's, it's 70 plus, it's 165 plus, seven, plus 68. So it's 230, what, yeah. 233? And they were strong. They were successful all that time. It's 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 a um, if you want a very good there's uh, on YouTube there's a channel by a historian who I'm a big fan of Sam Aronov S A M A R N O W um, and he does uh, he does a very good job with this period the Roman period the Roman period in Jewish history is um, very complex. Thank God we have a lot of sources about it, including uh, Josephus. But um, Israel is in the heart of a major of numerous major world empires. From maybe I don't know if you can have the Babylonians or the, the major empire, uh, world empire, the the Greeks uh, certainly and the Romans very much so, um, and so much of the the situation in Israel depended on. The relationship between um, the leaders and the population of Israel, uh, of uh, and and the wider empire in which it, it was part of, uh, and 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 things got better and, and things got worse, and, and there were you know there are different eras. Um, uh, Herod, who the Jews hated, was very popular in Rome, uh, and so on the one hand the Jews didn't like him at all, but on the other hand he uh, under his leadership. We had greater autonomy and um, freedom than under you know more righteous leaders and more beloved leaders. Uh, Gladys, thank you, thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. That's a great, great speech. You are the first one who clarified for us so much about the history of Hanukkah. We we had a lot of that before. But uh, yours was like uh, a, a nice history that we learned a lot from it. Thank you very much for your time and for your research and for uh, teaching us a lot of things that we didn't hear before. Thank I, you. Thank great... for... I thank it's everybody. I thank everybody great... for joining. Okay, fine. I'll say thank you very thank much you for having me. Thank you for listening. It's a great honor to be part of this group, to be invited to it, um, and uh, I look forward to to, uh, to you know more and more future um, classes and being part of it. I also want to point out it's very interesting talking about Hanukkah. So there are eight classes in the whole session this week, right? So, and a very nice association with Hanukkah. Rabbi, I just want to add to what you said about. Um... Hanukkah being so user friendly <laughs> is when my son was much younger. Um, he used to run 
to prepare the candelabra and he he was the one who initiated everything before I could get to it. Kids, um, you're right, they, they're drawn to it. Maybe because the message is so simple, it's bringing light. It's very simple. Actually, I think the message is, is very complicated because, I mean, as you grow older, I guess you realize such uh, momentous events were marked, are being marked by the lighting of the candles, which is basically that we have survived as a Jewish people. We, we could have disappeared, maybe. You know, um, but uh, it, it's to me, it's uh, it's really very deep as, um, uh, you oh, know, true. it changes That's our true. history, it changes, it changes our... True, but as a child... To oh, get as a child, you're it, right, you're right. I'm sorry. It's so simple. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. And even yeah. as we grow older and we know the whole history and all, but it all boils down to that very elemental thing. And Judaism is all about light. Right. And, and the, is, the first just, thing God did in the Torah, yeah. what did he do? Yeah. Let there be light. Let there be day, let there be night. Rabbi um, no, no, Ellis. But... Rabbi Ellis? Yes. Are you still there? Rabbi yes. Ellis, okay. Um, so uh, first of all, the fact that you obviously have studied Judaism and the history of Judaism, and you are, as you said, an amateur historian, makes it makes your your interest in um, uh, in our particular shared history um, much more passionate. Like you, you want to transmit it. I would assume that you would want to transmit it to as many people as possible. And so one, there are two things that I wanted to ask you. One, to do this again um, on some other, you know, teach us about some other um, event or time or uh, concept in Judaism, um, especially something that perhaps emerged out of history. And two, I would love to know um, about your experience in, in Poland. And um, I was in Poland, I, I went to many cities um, and I spoke to quite a few people and was extremely interesting, but Perhaps there's some things that you could uh, tell us. Is there a lot of uh, intermarriage? Um, that's the big thing. Are there Jewish schools? Uh, you know, whatever. Uh, so if ever you feel like it, mind you, I'm taking Gladys's, <laughs> I'm usurping her, her authority. But I'm just saying out of my interest, for my interest, I would, uh, I would love to hear you talk about it. I'm I'm happy to speak again in the, in the future, and if you want, we can I, I can put out the uh, can let people vote on what I what, what I speak about. I'm happy to speak about Poland. I'm happy to speak about other uh, historical development of other traditions. Um, I, I yeah, I'm happy, uh, more than willing and eager to to yeah, continue what, this what relationship Gigi, and can you be part of this group. What Gigi just asked it ties into what you did earlier this year with. Rosh Hashanah with um, Yom Kippur, you explained to us the whole nine yards about, you know, why we do this, why, why we don't allow this and why we don't allow that. And it was very enlightening. It, it, it cleared up a lot of questions that people have privately. And for once, somebody came and, you know, shared it in a group setting where everybody came out with their questions <laughs> so i think that's what Gigi is aiming for and i think it's a great idea what i like today when we will gather the family for hanukkah and we light the candle i will have something to explain to the children and the grandchildren what is hanukkah even though they were all in jewish schools but it's still, it's nice to, to discuss together 
what is Hanukkah, the history of the Hanukkah. So I learned today some new things that I can communicate to them. Thank you, Rabbi. That was a great session. We, thank you. We learned thank you, a thank lot. you, everyone. Yes, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Now, this session will be on the website, hopefully. Usually, every session is on the website, but recently the office is short of staff, so it is taking, it is not very fast that it is going on the website. And in every email that I sent, you have the link to the YouTube of the Women Learning Group. And you have all the recordings over there. Beside that, Gigi is doing a beautiful summary of every speech. And Sandra is doing it very nice artistically with, with the poster that she made. So if you miss anything of today, and if you would like to know again, and, and those who didn't come, hi, Albert, those who didn't come, you, you always follow our website, which is, as I said, in every email that I send, you, you just click on it and you will have all our sessions. Thank you so much, Rabbi. It was a Shukla great Rabbi, informative. Was a, quite interesting. Uh, I have another question. Can I ask one more question? Uh, with with uh, Purim, uh, being in Shushan town and all that, um, Who is it? Someone I don't recognize your voice. It's Vivi. It's Who Vivi are you? Belbo. Vivi Belbo. I just oh, can't get the video. I can get the audio. <laughs> I can see you all, but I can't get my own video. We were told it that in Shushan town, like the, we would have been annihilated as Jews in Iraq and in uh, the Middle East because of Purim, had it not been for Queen Esther. So, uh, like, Purim is very dear to us in, in uh, the Middle East. He's right. And it's not only that. When you said that we wouldn't be here, I was going to say every single episode in Jewish history, you can say that about. Like, what about when um, Ben Zakkai, the rabbi, I forgot his first name, uh, Ben Zakkai. He's yeah. yeah, he saved Judaism. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so hi. Many, uh, now it's, uh, by the way, oh. Vivi was a teacher. She was a teacher in the uh, US. Yeah. So for you a talk time. about <laughs> Judaism. In Atlanta. Vivi, what, you talked about Judaism. What did you teach? About Judaism, right? Yeah, yeah. I taught a lot of Judaism. But at a very young level. But uh, um, regarding Purim, that, that means a lot to us uh, too. Like I know it's not in the Chumash. Uh, it's not, but it's uh, like in, in Iraq, it, it was a secondary holiday. But here when we celebrate it, we really feel like a sense of uh, unity. And, uh... and curiously enough, Vivi, uh, uh -huh. I read, Curiously enough, I I learned from a very popular online rabbi, I think of Chabad, that during the time of the Geula, the only after Mashiach comes the only two, uh, the only Jewish festivals that will be required to be celebrated will be Hanukkah and Purim. Purim. Yes, I heard that. Yes, I, yeah. Because in both instances, uh, Jews were were saved. Jews were um, yeah. not annihilated. <laughs> but you know, like yeah, go, go yeah, back yeah. to Passover, same thing. We got saved. We yeah, but now we celebrate. That is mandatory to celebrate. Yeah. So. So the both we we have uh, we have two holidays that are ordained by the rabbis, not by the Torah. No, they're Hanukkah and Purim. Okay. Um, and they're both uh, so so certainly Purim without the miracle of Purim, you know, none of us would be here because all of the Jew, all of Jews at the time, were living within 
the the Persian oh, Empire. Right. Uh, but at the same time, when it's local, I mean, it's for for Jews in Iraq and in Persia, it's something local. It it, it feels closer because it, it and yeah yeah I I I understand that when I learn after living in Poland for thirteen years, when I learned the Torah of rabbis from Poland, it feels different. It feels more local. It feels more essential. Um, the the these two the I mean the, there there's a lot to compare about these two different holidays. Um, you know, um, Purim it happened when we were in a when we were strangers in a strange land, more or less, <clears throat> and um, and the the goal was to annihilate us physically. Whereas uh, Hanukkah happened when we were at home, uh, and in in our on our own homeland. And the goal was to annihilate us spiritually. Um, also, if you look at the the, the holidays, the, you know Purim is very much in, in the connection to the temple. Purim is about wine, uh, and Hanukkah is about oil, olive oil. So these are the two. And if you look at the 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 the, the, the different things that were offered in the Beit Hamikdash, these are two of the major offerings. The, the, with ever when, with every sacrifice, you'd bring olive oil and you'd bring wine as well. Um, and these are both these are both rabbinic holidays, and they're holidays of Jewish survival. We used to have there still is in existence a Megillah, a scroll called Megillat Taanit, the scroll of fasts, which has lists all these different days in Jewish history. It was it was just, we stopped uh, in which miracles or important events happened for the Jewish people that we used to celebrate um, after the destruction of the Second Temple. The only two holidays that we still celebrate from that Megillah from is our Purim and Hanukkah, because essentially everything that was in all these different holidays that were in, part of this Megillah, they were relevant to the the they were relevant to the state of Israel or I don't know or the Republic of Israel or the, the territory the I don't know the Kingdom of Israel at that time, but once that once that kingdom once that entity ceased to exist. Their importance also became their importance went away, whereas Hanukkah and Purim uh, are clearly um, uh, important for for our whole history. Um, the and they're both part of both of these is the recognition of God's uh, us taking the time to recognize God's intervention in history for the Jewish people. And the, Rabbi, the sage, I, oh, sorry. So Rabbi um, Rabbi's. Um, Rabbi uh, Avraham Yitzchak Cohen Kuk Zetzal, the first chief rabbi of Israel, of Palestine, <clears throat> uh, he in in Hebrew the word his, uh, history is historia, so usually it's it's spelled with a with the letter taf. Uh, he changed the spelling to a tet, so that when you break the word historia down, it's historia. The the the, the histor is like Esther, the hidden hiddenness or uh, of God. He said that history is the process of God. Is is God? Is, is, are, are, we need to study history to see how God hides Himself uh, through in in the, in the world, and to see the and that the study of history is a process of uh, of, of particular of, of redemption of the Jewish people and and of the whole world. And Rav Cook was the one who said way in the beginning, by all means, you must settle Judea and Samaria. This is our homeland and this is the heart of our history um i just want to add that you know when uh the story of purim was you know wrapped up and it became a festival and esther made it a, a festival for all of persia to celebrate and all of the jews she asked the rabbis to add this into the canon and they they feared that if they did so, um, other nations would, uh, you know, look upon it and remember and um, choose more occasions to attack us. But she insisted and she said, it's more important that the Jews look at this story time and time again. They have to in throughout history, be reminded of this story. And I think the most important part of her whole story of Purim is 
the point at which she told Mordechai, get everyone to pray. Hmm. Which is what the rabbis are telling us today at after October 7. If we did more of that, there wouldn't have been uh, such a such a Holocaust uh, on October 7. If we didn't go and um, desecrate Yom Kippur services on Bizingoff, if we didn't, because you know the Muslims, they're so passionate about religion. And they, I heard this, it, that they really, really, really don't respect anything that repudiates religion. And when they see the Jewish people, the chosen people in their holy land desecrating their faith, that's a big green light for them. They, they don't respect it. So th their mindset is one of, we think in terms of the individual, you know, you can set up your dreams, your whole life. Uh, Mordechai Kedar said, they don't look at it this way. They look at life in terms of, they have no choice, first of all, but the community, the, their tribe, their they're told who they can marry. They, they have no choice in these things. Who and, and if they go out from the fold, they're killed. So Hanukkah reminds us that faith is so important. So it's to like get going. Time. Thank you so much, Rabbi, for your presentation. I have to get going. Thank you. Thank you all. Good to Good to see you all. Thank you. Thank you, Albert, Thank you. for I'll, sharing with me. Uh, I'll, I'll like to... oh, so I'll, I'll end one story that I've, I've got to, I, I have to leave as well. But I'll, one thing that I was, the, on what the Sandra said, uh, it, it's, a, it's a true story. I don't know if it's fact, but there was a, there was a terrorist in, in, in prison in Israel, uh, and, he had, and, and he saw one of his guards eating a cheeseburger. And he said, what are you doing? He said, what? Yeah. He said, you're eating meat and milk together. It's forbidden by, by your law. Yeah. And the guard said, yeah, yeah, we don't do that anymore. He said, you don't do that anymore? He said, there you know, I've been sitting here for a long time thinking about all my resistance. And then I thinking, you know what? The Jews, God gave them Israel, so why should I fight it? And I was going to tell my children, my grandchildren, stop fighting. But if you don't do that anymore... And I'm going to tell them to fight to the end. If you there don't do you that go. anymore, then what right do you have? Yeah, to say this is a holy land and this is a no, 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 no. This is a, our history and all. And we came back to our own. Uh, you know, like I was listening to um, David Friedman being interviewed by David Rubin. David Freeman, the former ambassador to, to Israel from the United States. And, you know, he's talking uh, about how he thinks of the situation and to state, oh, no, you can't do that. But then in the end, he said, look, we have to remember that um, there is a God who... <clears throat> Like you say, he, he's behind history. He, he comes and goes, and we, we have to search him out. And he, he's the author of, of diversity. And he, you know, like, if we, he said, at the end of the day, there is a God there. He, he is um, orchestrating, for God's sake, the whole universe. I mean, all the planets don't collide. Why? There has to be something much, much bigger than the planets, much, much bigger than the sun, than any, that's the whole universe. And so to throw that out the window is so childish. It's like people have been worshiping God for millennia, said this rabbi. How can you all of a sudden say, decide for yourself? 
So in the end, we have to come together. And they are. They're, they're soldiers who are begging to have it fill in. I would like to mention before we conclude, thank you, Sandra, uh, that uh, next week will be the last session of the series. We will have eight sessions in the, the series, and it will be our reverend cantor, Daniel Benlolo. It, it will be celebrating the end of the series and all the music. That's too much. Every, Take half of it. It will be a musical session. So I hope you enjoyed everything. Each session is completely different. Today, have we, had, yeah. we had a wonderful time. Rabbi, I, I was telling Gladys, I'm really, really looking forward to this session with Rabbi Alice. No, too and much. I, I, I know that I would have no, 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 no. Thank you so much. Yes, we learned so much. We learned a lot of new new things. And uh, it is always nice to be with Rabbi El Ellis Company. We always enjoy your company, Rabbi. Thank you. We have we appreciate everything. All your lectures, all your speeches, we learn a lot from them. And you bring us together. You always bring us together. And this is very important for us. We, we like each other. We are like a group for many years. That, that's why we survived all those 15 years together in the, because we like each other. We have always been a group together. Before the sessions, we were a group. So, but you know what Rabbi Ellis once said, is, I think it was his very first doctorate in our synagogue in the Mash Al Sanctuary. He said, and I'll never forget it, and it's so true. He said, um, I can't be everything to everyone, but I promise to do my utmost to do whatever it takes to bring everyone together. And that's what counts. And he says, um, and the only way I know how to do that, the best way I know how to do that is with the Torah. And that's so beautiful. It almost made me cry. This is what we are doing in the Women Learning Group. We had one year, we did Ladies Bat Mitzvah, and it was a great celebration. 250 people we were in the party, and many of them were our children and grandchildren and our close friends. And from that, Women Learning Group was born and we enjoy it all, all the time. This is what keeps us always together and we learn and we enjoy. And uh, But what I like is that now Rabbi Ellis is bringing all of us together outside of the women's learning group fold also. Women's learning group was and is so central to our community because of its consistency. Um, but now I I really was craving for that kind of spirit to pervade the whole, the bigger community. And I I really I have very high hopes. Thank you, Rabbi. We through the Zoom, we are having many new people. And we are having sometimes people from all over the world. And sometimes speakers from different countries. Yeah. I know. And uh, that's an advantage. Thank you again very much, Rabbi Ellis. That was a great speech. We learned a lot. And thank you all for jo joining us. Thank you all for keeping us going. And thank you, Senya, you are the center. Without you, we cannot have on Zoom. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you, Gladys. You've been wonderful.